bees? No. Oh. oh. I mean, oh, is these, there any spray or whatever? If you um, the the emerald them? ash borer, uh, again, there's some chemicals that uh, they, they could treat the tree with, um, but we're not recommending that. NGSU, the North Dakota Forest Service, um, they're all recommending that the insect isn't here. So why spend, like I said, it's, it's going to cost you a couple hundred dollars to inject your tree. Why spend all that money when the insect isn't here? Once the insect, insect gets established in the state, and it's, uh, I think NGSU and the Forest Service and Department of Ag are saying within 15 mile radius, uh, once the insect uh, becomes established in a 15 mile radius, then you can try to treat your tree. Otherwise, you're just going to be spending a lot of money on insect that's not here yet. Uh, Dutch elm disease, like I said, there are some fungicides, but you have to do it every two years and it's pretty pricey. The Japanese beetles, um, I don't know if there's anything um, for chemical control. I would have to read through the, the bullets and they have up there, but um, I don't know. Okay. I, I would have to check on that. but. There, there are some chemical treatments out there for these things, but uh, some of the treatments are pretty costly and, and may not be, um, may not be cost, uh, costly for you to do it. Uh, another problem that we've been seeing here in Bismarck for the last seven, eight, nine years, and this is a, a, another exotic pest, and this is called uh, cottony psyllid. Um, these will attack black ash and mancan ash, and uh, our forestry division, we got cursed out because way back before these guys got established, we were telling folks that black ash are the perfect tree to plant on the boulevard. These are beautiful trees, they're hardy for the state. People planted black ash all over the place, and then once you know it, a year or two, year or two later, cottony silage showed up and black ash are dying all over. Now people said, well, you're the ones that told us to plant this tree. It's like, we didn't know there was an invasive insect out there. But if you curl back the leaves here, the ones that are curled, you'll see kind of a little cottony material in there. And that's what the little psyllids are doing. They, they form a little protection under the leaves. They curl them, they form this little cottony material. That's why they're called cottony psyllids. Psyllids are kind of a cross between an aphid and um, uh, well, they're sort of like an aphid type insect where they're piercing and feeding on the insect. But these guys are very, very tiny. You, you need almost a hand lens or microscope to see these guys. But um, this is one, again, you can treat the trees. Uh, the best product that we've been seeing to control cottony psyllid is the Bear, Bear Advanced Tree and Shrub Insecticide. And Bear is spelled B-A-Y-E-R, just like the aspirin. Um, this is a product that you put down in the springtime and you don't have to worry about it for 12 months after, but it's something you have to put down every year. And this is something, folks, again, it, it wasn't... Um, um, economic for them to control every year. We had people applying the bare aspirin every year and the trees looked healthy and after a couple of years the folks say well you know my trees are healthy they're looking good I'm not going to spend the money anymore on this product and they stopped treating the tree um, and some folks two years later after stopped treating the tree now their trees are back to, to the bad state and in most cases they're dead. And what will happen, you'll see, like in this handout in that sample, the leaves will curl, and if you peel back the leaves, and if you see that little white material, that little cottony material under there, that's your cottony psyllid. The other thing we've been seeing associated with cottony psyllid is um, a couple of things. One is um, a canker disease, and we're, uh, it's called uh, alcohol flux, where the bark will start bubbling and the, the reason they call it alcohol flux is because that bubbling looks like the head of a beer. Um, don't drink it because it <laughs> smells really nasty and, it, and I, God knows what it tastes like, but uh, it, it's really nasty kind of. 
bees will like it. You, you'll see a lot of bees hovering around it, but once this bubbling, oozing stuff will start coming out, then you'll see the bark peeling off the tree. Once that bark peels off the tree, your tree's a goner. Uh, and the last nail in the coffin for these trees is that we're, we're seeing the ash lilac um, beetles come in and invade the tree. And so if the, the canker, the, if the cottony psyllid and if the canker hasn't killed the tree, the ash lilac borer will finish off the tree for you. So, yeah. And so we have not seen a lot of um, black ash or man can healthy ash trees in town. We've been treating our trees um, on the downtown area on Main Street. We have a lot of black ash and man can ash. Um, there's a couple of parks that we have where we have black ash, and we've been treating our trees every year. We have our folks go out in the springtime and treat them, and they still look pretty healthy. So it's the treating, keeping the tree healthy, will keep it alive. But like I said, if, if you think you can skip a year or two, you're, you're just opening that tree to, to a future population of the insect. Does it attack only the black ash? Black ash and man can ash. Yeah. Manchurian and black ash are the two. Green ash, they don't go after. Because we have some, uh, I believe there's Japanese lilac. Okay. Yeah, or maybe Chinese, something different lilac. And something is curling the leaves on them just about every year. And those could be another aphid or, or uh, some sort. Yeah, yeah. Some, yeah. I tell folks that if you go out and shake a tree really hard, you will be amazed at the number of things that fall out of the tree. Um, unfortunately, we, we have folks that think uh, the environment should be bug free, and that's just not the case. We, uh, I get people, uh, I, I had one lady, she thought I was a smart aleck because she had a big old caterpillar on her tree, and she said, what should I spray my tree with? It? And she goes, this thing's eating leaves. She goes, what should I sp spray the tree with? And it was one insect, so I picked it off and squished it. And I said, I just saved yourself $24. And yeah. she, we've, uh, we've been getting like a spider web on our, especially on our blooming crab where they show up. What's a good spray to be spraying them with? Uh, well, again, uh, and I should have probably started my presentation in making the statement is before you do any treatment of your tree, you need to properly identify what the problem is because there's insects, there's fungus, there's mites, um, there's bacteria, and you need to properly identify what the problem is first before you start spraying because I've had folks spray their tree with an insecticide and it's been a fungal problem. Um, last year we had a, a big problem with, with um, apple scab, which is a fungal problem. And I have folks tell me they were spraying their tree with an insecticide. Well, insecticides aren't going to take care of a fungus, so you need to properly identify what the problem is before you go after a, a treatment. And again, some of these insect problems may just be a cosmetic problem that, that um, you may not need to treat, but there are some um, that you, you might have to, to treat. Apple scab, Last year and the year before, we had a big problem with apple scab, and apple scab is one of those fungal problems that pops up when we have cold, wet springs. You know, it was fairly cold this year, but I don't think it was as wet as it's been in the past. It's been cold, but not as wet. Um, so we haven't seen a lot of apple scab yet. Another problem that we've seen due to cold, wet springs is ash anthracnose. And, um, uh, I thought I had a sample and I didn't bring it with me. Uh, but ash anthracnose will happen on green ash where the margins will kind of turn brown, uh, distorted, and the leaves will fall off. We had that happen uh, last year and the year before. This year I, I've seen a little bit of it. I haven't seen a lot. But those are some, the apple scab and the ash anthracnose are fungal problems that you could try to spray early in the year. And this is the other thing to know about controlling insect and disease problems is that you need to know the life cycle of these diseases. When people see apple scab form, an apple scab is when the leaves of the apple get brown and they fall off, they'll, they'll turn yellow or brown and fall off. 
Ash anthracnose is the same thing. You'll get these brown lesions on the margins. Sometimes they'll turn yellow and they'll fall off. It's when, when people see that happening, they want to go out and spray with a fungicide. Apple scab and ash anthracnose, you need to spray in the spring when the buds of the trees are beginning to swell. That's when the fungus is infecting those leaves. And you need to spray the tree three times when the buds are beginning to swell, when the buds are starting to emerge, the leaves are starting to emerge from the leaf, and then when the leaf is about maybe a half inch to an inch big. Those are the three times to spray. Unfortunately, people don't think about that in the spring when there's no leaves on the tree. They always think about spraying after the leaves are starting to fall off, and by then it's too late to do anything. So, again, a lot of businesses don't like me telling folks that because they're basically spending money on something that's not going to work. And the, some of those businesses, they like to sell those chemicals and they like people to go and spray their tree with all sorts of things and spend the money. But knowing what the insect problem or the disease problem, the life cycle, could uh, help you control the, the, the proper spray timing and could save you a lot of money. And the forest, our forestry division, um, we try to answer a lot of calls. Uh, I know Extension here, they answer a lot of call, calls. So there's folks out here, out there that are knowledgeable that could help you figure out what you have and help you figure out how to control that disease if it needs to be controlled. If Is that fungal disease like the ash anthracnose, is that something that will stick with the tree year after year? So if you have, have it one year, you should go ahead and spray the next? Again, ash and anthracnose will pop up when we have cold, wet springs. And who knows? Yeah, and that's, that's the problem. <laughs> no. And that's what I tell folks. I mean, in, in, I mean, if you watch the weather, you know, weather people, they, sometimes they can't even get the weather right in that week. So there's no weather people here, are there? <laughs> I'm weather. Uh, meteorologist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. But no, I mean, you know, it, it is. I mean, you yeah. know, they they say chance of rain, and I think the reason they say chance of rain is because they they're not sure. I mean, and yeah. they 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 may say we have a chance of a cold, wet spring again, and it may be cold, but maybe dry. But there's maybe, always a chance. Yeah, there's always a chance. <laughs> there's always exactly, exactly. There's always a chance of of that happening. So. Um, do you want to, you know, treat the tree to uh, prevent those things? Yeah, you could do that if you want to spend the money. Um, ash anthracnose and apple scab, for the most part, will not kill the tree, but if you have two, three, maybe four years in a row, then it will stress the tree and some of these other insects will come in. I don't know if that's kind of a wishy-washy answer, but that's about the best I could give. No, I, you know, it makes sense. I just didn't know if it, you know, if you get it one year, if it's really going to show up the next year, regardless of what the weather does or whatever. But it doesn't sound like okay, so. And that's that's um, some of these diseases are dependent on the weather, especially the fungal problems. I think with uh, apple scab, I think once the temperatures get over. 74, 75, 76 degrees, then you don't have any worries about the fungal spores surviving. Once the, once it gets to a certain temperature, the spores will not survive anymore. I don't know, do you guys have any information? Uh, yeah, it, uh, one book that... Um, You're talking for anthracnose or for which one here now? Well, for an apple scab or, or both of them. Um, I don't know if we have any for apple scab yeah. out there, but... But there's... There's uh, some publications up here on trees, and, and like I say, uh, at your extension, there's a lot of good material out there. And uh, there's a lot of disease and insects to keep track of, and I, I'm getting to the point where I have a hard time remembering what happened last week, so to remember what chemical to apply to one insect or disease or whatever, it, it's there's a lot to remember, and sometimes I have to refer to publications myself to refresh my memory. But um, did bring it? Yeah, we had some folks here bring in some samples for us to look at, and 
This is something we saw last year on laurel leaf willow. I love these trees. They're kind of a small to medium sized tree. I think the maximum height of these trees is 25, 30 foot tall. But the thing I love about laurel leaf willow is that the leaves are so glossy and shiny on a, on a uh, windy or kind of a gentle breeze day and the sun is out. If you're a long distance away, it almost looks like the tree is white because the sun reflects off of this, that uh, it almost looks white. And um, it's because the leaves are so glossy. Um, but one thing that we saw last year, we saw a lot of the laurel leaf willows develop these stunted leaves and they kind of had a yellowish tinge to them. A lot of the leaves fell off. I had uh, some of the folks from NDSU come out in, in Fargo. Um, Aaron Bergdahl from Fargo, he came out last year and we looked at some of these trees and the best he could figure out was it was an environmental problem. Cold, wet spring was doing this to the trees. Um, we were hoping that the trees would recover. Um, I looked at four or five willows that were doing this. Two of them died completely, the other three recovered. So uh, will this pull through? Who knows, watering and fertilizing might be your best bet to, again, keep the tree healthy, try to give the, the tree a little bit of water. If it's dry, um, you may need to give it a little bit of fertilizer and see if that helps. But we couldn't figure out what was going on here, and the best thing we could say <coughs> was water and fertilize. Um, some little oddities I, I brought here. This little guy here, you'll see these things come out of box elders. A lot of box elders that are stressed, dying. Um, yeah, that's. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. When they fly by your head, they will scare the dickens out of you. Uh, they are. They, they're a wasp and they like to go after trees that are, are decayed and dying and they will lay their eggs in that it's decay material and they will fly out. It's a wasp of? A, a wasp of some sort, yeah. And they, uh, um, they are big and they will intimidate you if they come flying by. They'll have you swinging, huh? Yeah, yeah, you don't want to upset them. Oh. Uh, some other odd things that we've seen in town, um, and I haven't seen a lot of this, but this is a sample that I took last year, so it's all dried out and it's not, uh, the color has dist uh, uh, distorted, but this is on a maple tree. Um, parts of the branches were dying off. We were trying to figure out what was going on, so we pruned off some of the branches to look at the branches. and Right under the bark, we saw this green streaking, and this is a, a verticillium wilt. Verticillium wilt is a fungus, and it's a natural soil-borne fungus, so it's out there naturally. Trees that are stressed um, are susceptible to it. But like I said, uh, we saw this on one tree in Bismarck here. I talked to the folks in Fargo to see if they've seen anything, and. Uh, as far as they know, they've only seen it on rare occasions. So this is something that I don't think is a big thing, but it's one of those oddities that, like I say, every time I say that we don't have that problem in town, something will pop up to prove me wrong. So uh, verticillin will, will, so if you're seeing some of your maples, especially the sugar maples or the uh, uh, Tatarian maples, if you're seeing branches, this dying, the leaves will turn brown and stay on there and that branch dies. Uh, snip off a, a branch and see if you see any of this green streaking under the bark and, and you may have this verticillin wool. Again, this is one of those problems where there's not much you can do because it's a soil-borne fungus. The best thing you do, can do is just keep the tree healthy and vigorous and try to prune out the diseased areas. On that. that word verticillin wool, isn't that something to do with sunflowers too? Could be. I'm. That sounds that, familiar to me from the farming days. Yeah, I'm. I'm not a agriculturalist, no. but you, you can you, run into that. Yeah, you, you do run uh, into that. You can run form. into that. Yeah, so. we're 
we were in Barnes County where they raised a lot of sunflowers year after year, year after year, we tried to quit because of that and a few other diseases. On that willow that we brought you, know, that sample that's not very healthy, there's quite a few branches on the tree that are dead this year now, and I'm pruning them all off. Yeah, and that's the best thing you could do with some of those branches that are dead, is pruning them all out and get them out. Like I said, we, we walked away scratching our head, and um, I, I checked with Aaron to see if he had any other words of wisdom, and his parting advice was keep it healthy, water and, and fertilize. Kind of good luck. Huh? Yeah, good luck. And we just don't know if it was the environment or what. And, and a well, lot of times it didn't have a nice light color to it like normally if you cut off a little piece it's yeah. kind of a creamy color in there it was kind of a more of a chocolatey color yeah. the environment is pretty tough on our trees here this last winter we've seen a lot of conifers um, everything from arborvitae juniper some of the spruce um, they got beat up. They bad. got beat up bad. The arborvitae, especially, I, I saw a couple of use. Uh, some homeowners had some foundation plants use, and these were well established plants that, um, um, because of the heat from the building, most most winters the trees will do pretty well. And usually, there's a lot of snow that kind of insulates them. This year, we didn't have a lot of snow, and we had a lot of sub-zero weather and. Most of the ewes that I looked at are fried, completely dead. Arborvitae the same. A lot of arborvitaes are, are destroyed to the point where you can't prune out the tree and have a decent looking plant. Um, some of the junipers and the spruce, we're telling folks just to kind of wait and see because I, I was finding some healthy buds on the tree. Hopefully those buds will fill in and it may be a couple of years. You may have some brown spots for a couple of years, but hopefully they'll fill in. But it was a real tough winter, and I could drive around town, and you could see whole neighborhoods where arborvitaes are, are just fried. Are you seeing the same thing? Absolutely, it's everywhere. I mean, country and town, I and mean, it's and it's across the state. Too, yeah. So, um, just a question on that. So, in terms of your winter burn on a lot of these, you know, conifers, what's your recommendation in terms of how long do you wait until you actually trim back that potential dead tissue or that discolored tissue? Good question. Um, I, I've been telling folks uh, this this spring to give it a couple more weeks. So if things are still brown by the first of July, you may have to prune out. And, and I have some folks where if they prune out, they're going to be pruning out the whole half of the tree. And then it, it, it gets to the point. Uh, and, and I tell folks that you're the king or queen uh, queen of your landscape. If you can't tolerate the aesthetic value of that tree, then you may just want to remove the tree. But if um, I've looked at some trees where um, the winter injury is on the back side of the property. So when they look out their porch, they're seeing a nice green thing, but the neighbor might be. I said, this depends on how well you like your neighbor. Well, you're, you're taping this, aren't you? I should, I should, behave, my, I should behave myself. But, uh, that, and that's the truth. It depends on what you can tolerate, the aesthetic value of that plant. If it's still in a place where you're looking out the window and it's still green and, and from what that vantage point, if you still think that plant is providing a benefit to your yard, leave it. If it's on the back side, um, if it's in the corner, it might be in the alley, and that side is dead and you're not going down that alley a lot, well maybe then you want to leave that plant. But you know, that's it's it's tough to tell the homeowners to leave it, prune it. Let it, you know, hopefully it'll fill in itself. It's kind of a waiting and it depends on what you can tolerate. A lot of folks have put a lot of time and effort in some of those plants that get to the point where they put in 10, 15 years and they just don't want to walk away from it. But Can I ask a question on roses? Okay. They're coming up, they're blooming real nice, but the top part has got all the nice leaves and roses on it, but the under greenery and that is dying away on me turning kind of a the leaves are kind of full of holes and got like a whitish mildew color to them and it just looks uglier and heck and I'm wondering I, I should have brought a sample of it along but I forgot 
Yeah, roses do get quite a few problems. Uh, I think some of the common problems with roses are uh, pear slugs. They might cause some of that skeletonation or maybe some holes. Um, powdery mildew, I think ro some roses get some powdery mildew. A lot of the rose sprays have powdery mildew yeah. protection in it. Yeah. So well, yeah, that, that, that kind of white, that whitish material, yeah. that, you're, you, that might be, but usually I see powdery mildew kind of popping up later in the year. Um, have you had any experience with rose? I'm, I'm not a big rose person. Uh, Are you, it's just kind of a discoloration, something similar to that right there. I don't have a whole lot of experience with roses. I do have some friends out in you know, Pacific mm -hmm. Northwest who do quite a bit. Is it something like that made by Bayer. Stock, It's just the leaves it's themselves. Systemic there. for roses. Every six weeks, you're supposed to water them down. The, the, the leaves are just getting well, you got for six weeks, real good for pale color, got and little holes, fertilizer, like through and, them. Else. and then they're getting. I've been um, doing that. Yeah, well, whitish color well, but on the leaves. You know, I don't see that here. here. So is there like a powdery yeah. film on yeah. it? Well, I didn't like to see if it's powdery and come on. Means to bring a piece of it along, and you can look at it next time it come off the garden. For sure. That work? Yeah, absolutely. Bring it. I'll do that. Yeah. For sure. Down in Arizona, there were damn roses grow like weeds down there. <laughs> you trim them back about four times a year. Yeah, they don't ever see 40 or below. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's but yeah that, like I say, uh, North Dakota is a tough place to grow a lot of plants. And uh, that's the other thing I tell folks when they go to buy a tree. Do a little research on the tree. Um, there, there are so many cultivars, especially with the maples that are coming out, uh, that have some really nice red fall colors. Um, check to see what the hardiness zone of the plant is. Uh, there's some plants that are borderline hardy for, for our region. Uh, and, and just because the, the tag says it's hardy for zone 3 or zone 4, the soil conditions may not be conducive for the plant. Uh, we see a lot of folks wanting to plant maple trees. And uh, with all the new subdivisions going in town, um, Boulder Ridge, um, up north, um, I, I, there's so many of those subdivisions, I can't, I can't even keep up on the names of them anymore, but we see a lot of folks planting maple trees up in that north end of town, and for the most part, the soil's being stripped off and they're leaving a lot of compacted clay or you know, sub, you know, substandard soil, yeah. and those maples, they like well-drained, loamy soil. They like the soil a little more on the acidic side. And we're seeing a lot of chlorosis problems on the maples. We're seeing a lot of maples getting tattered by the winds. So just because the tag says it, it's a zone for zone three or four, um, do a little more research. Find out what the soil conditions. You, you might find that the tree wants well-drained soil or more of a acidic soil. And some of these areas are going to be on the alkaline side and they're not going to be very well-drained. And you may spend a lot of money planting the tree and